The Australian Children's Television Foundation and ACME respectfully acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are joining you today, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the East Kulin Nation. We honour their continuing cultures and connections to the land, waters and skies and pay our respects to the Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples throughout Australia. Teachers, please share your students' responses and questions in the Zoom chat throughout the workshop. Let's start by sharing the names of the traditional custodians of the lands on which you are joining us today. and welcome to the students and teachers joining us from all over Australia. I'm Janine from the Australian Children's Television Foundation. Hello everyone, I'm Alan from ACME, the Museum of Screen Culture. We're so excited to be your host for this special book week event with Australian author Nadia Wheatley. I wonder how many people have dressed up this week as their favourite book characters. Maybe some of you are dressed up today. So many of you are, I bet. Well, I love Book Week, Ellen, and I have to tell you that I particularly love this book that we are talking about today. I do too. I have my copy here that I had when I was at school, which was about the time it was first released. I also love that this wonderful book was adapted into a TV show. Well, that's what a great story can do. Whether stories are told through speaking, being written down in a book or being shown on screen, they have the power to entertain us, inspire us and educate us. The book My Place by Nadia Wheatley and Donna Rawlins has certainly done that. We are so happy to have author Nadia Wheatley here with us today, beaming in from sunny Sydney to chat all about My Place and to answer all of your storytelling questions. So let me introduce her now. Nadia has been writing books for over 40 years fiction and non-fiction, books for children, books for adults, short books and long books. I can't wait to hear what she shares with us today about storytelling, particularly about the wonderful book, My Place. Nadia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me and it's terrific for this chance to talk to children and their teachers right across Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of where I live and as I do that I'd like you all, as you're seeing this slide on the screen, to read along with me. Now I live in Sydney, as Janine's already mentioned, so that's on Cadigal Wongal land. But wherever you are, you're living on Aboriginal land and you should know, I bet you do, the name of the traditional owners or traditional custodians of your place the place where you're living. So when I start talking, when I start reading, read aloud with me. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we live and learn. We pay our respects to the elders, past and present, and we thank them for taking care of country over countless generations. I always begin my sessions with that because as well as being polite and respectful to acknowledge the traditional First Nations people, it's also great because it brings us straight to the theme of what we're going to be talking about. So today we're talking about a book called My Place. We could have called it My Country. The place where you live is also Aboriginal land and it's land that we share. It's our heartland or our homeland and that's what the book is is about. My Place has a beautiful timeline at the start. Can you tell us about the purpose and the meaning of the timeline? Yes, yeah, so the timeline at the beginning of My Place in your book as you open up the first two pages tells 
the story of the book. My Place is a story, but it's also a history. It tells the story of Australia from now, going back through all the time that people came from right across the world to live in this country, and it goes back to the time when there were only First Nations or Aboriginal people living here. In the book, time goes backwards in little slots of 10 years as the storytellers or narrators tell you about the place in their own voices. So the timeline, and you can see there's little pictures there, it gives it us little picture windows into all the history and story in the book. Back to those circles that you see right up in the top corner. Maybe you might see some circles that are a bit similar on one of the wonderful Aboriginal pictures that is behind me. So those circles tell us about deep time, the very, very long thousands and thousands and thousands of years that generations of Aboriginal people, children and their mums and dads and grandparents have been living here in Australia. And we learn a little bit more about that in the very last page of the book. Here we see the last page. We see a girl called Barangaroo and she's sitting up at the top of the tree. And you can look at the colours on that page and I bet you know what the colours represent, what they symbolise. Think of the flag that you think of when you see those colours. And Barangaroo tells you this. Sometimes at the end of the day, I climb to the top of the big tree and play that I'm the only person in the world. If I look one way, the sea runs out till it meets the sky. But the other way, the land goes on till the sun sets. My grandmother says, we've always belonged to this place. But how long, I ask, and how far, my grandmother says, forever and ever. So those words forever and ever give us a sense of that very, very deep time that Aboriginal people have been caring for country, caring for this homeland, this heartland. In my place, whether it's the TV series or whether it's the book, we have First Nations storytellers at the beginning and the end. And I think of them kind of putting their arms around like this and hugging the story. So in these two slides, we see actors from the TV series depicting the characters from the book as they tell us their story. And they're in the big tree. And that's the big tree that inspired the story. We'll have a look at it again in a minute. And it's also the tree that was used as the location for the television series. So that theme runs all through the story. And I think when you see Janine and Ellen talking to you today, you might see another picture of that same big tree. Thank you so much, Nadia. It is a beautiful image we're sitting in front of today. Now you've spoken so, uh, so beautifully about how time and history are central to your book. Could you tell us now about the places in the story? Which places are important in these characters' lives and why so? Okay, well, place is very important to this book. So important that it got itself into the title. But place is also important to all my books. Place is always the inspiration for me, whether I'm writing a storybook for grown-ups or children or whether I'm writing a history book, I always begin by walking into the place. And I use my senses, my ears, my eyes, my nose, my sense of touch, but I also use my feet. And my feet tell me lots of things as I walk around a place. In this slide, we see the three real places that inspired the story, and they are also places that are used as locations in the television series. So at the centre, you have that big tree, a photo of the big tree that grows really, really close to me. And I used to sit, long before I wrote the book, I used to sit on those sort of armchair roots of the tree and I used to imagine generations of children playing in the tree, maybe building forts or just climbing the tree, going there to play with friends and also going there like we sometimes do when we just want to be by ourselves and have a bit of a think. Now every tree is different of course and this particular tree is what we call an Australian 
fig tree. So I've brought along some leaves today. You can see they're very shiny and smooth. They're very big leaves. They're shiny and smooth on one side and on the other side, they're a beautiful rusty brown. Because it's a little bit early in the season, they don't have any fruit yet, but it is a fig tree, an Australian fig tree. And that's very important to the story of my place, that it's a tree that has food on it, food for people and food for possums and other animals. One of the other photos here is a photo of some houses or some homes in this suburb where I live. We can see them, they're quite crowded together, maybe where you live, your home looks very different from that. My home looks a little bit like that, but it's only got one story. But wherever you live, your home is your place and your very important place. The third picture shows us a waterway, a creek or a canal. And if you go back to the home picture, you can see that the street is running down to it. This is how my feet help me explore and learn about history because when you walk down a sloping street, you know which way the water goes when it rains. And when you know which way the fresh water goes, you know where Aboriginal people made their Ngora, their homes for thousands of years, and you know where the first settlers built their farms and unfortunately their factories. So when we look at that water, it looks a bit dirty these days, but it was once a beautiful, fresh, water creek. These are the three things we need as well as air. We need food, we need water and we need shelter or a home. Maps are a part of every character's story in my place. Why are these maps so important to the story? When I do that exploring to start understanding my story, I also do a little map, just a little sketch map, not to be a beautiful illustration as Donna did for the book, but just to help me understand and develop the story. So in this first draft map, you can see a little green splodge, which is the fig tree. You can see a salty or tidal river running into a big salty water bay, but you can see the little freshwater creek and the little mura, the little houses that the Aboriginal people, the Barangaroos people, would have built along the creek. So in that map, I've got all the things that I'm going to need to help me develop the story. So I drew my little maps and then Donna, my friend and collaborator and illustrator, drew the maps rather more neatly uh, for the book. So here we have the first map you'll find in the book and it's Laura's map. But you can see the same things. You can see the splodge of green for the tree. You can see a little red love heart for my place and you can see the blue line along the bottom for the water. So when you go through my place on every one of the 20 pages, you'll find a map, a different map, a map representing the story of the storyteller of that page. But you'll always find those three things, the fig tree, the water, and the home. Look too at the map at the way the words are written in sentences so that the character is actually telling you about her friends and where she goes to school, where the grandmother or grandfather lives and all sorts of things about the neighbourhood so that we get the story developing actually in the maps. So here's, here's how the story develops. This is the first double page in the book and in it we meet a girl called Laura or she meets us because she introduces herself to us in her very first words. She says, my name's Laura and this is my place. I turned 10 last week. Our house is the one with a flag on the window. So again, I don't need to tell you what that flag is. You'll all know. And she goes on to talk about her brother. Tony says it shows we're on Aboriginal land, but I, and I think it is the colour of the earth back home. As we hear about Laura's story from her, she tells us about her pet called Gully and she gives us a map and she tells us about her birthday party which was held up under the uh, big tree. It was a picnic, an evening picnic when dad and Tony and mum had come home from work. This is the very second last page of the book. So the last page is the one you've seen, the one with the tree on it, but this is the second last page and here we meet Baron Guru, our final storyteller. And she says, my name's Baron Guru. 
I belong at this place. We're staying here for the summer at the creek camp, and you know where the creek is, at the creek camp to get the fish down in the bay. But often we stay a while at other places. Everywhere we go is home. She gives you a map that's rather bigger than other people's maps in the book. She talks about her pet, which is a dog, a little bit like Laura's dog, I think. And she talks about her party, which is a big party held down on the bay. But again, in that map, you see the essential things. You see the fig tree, you see the mura or little houses, and you see the fresh water. Thank you so much for sharing that, Nadia. It's great to learn more about the maps in the book and their uh, significance and how students can use this themselves in their own storytelling. Uh, now, your discussion's making me think about this idea of a special place in storytelling. And we think this is a great chance for students out there joining us to think about their own special place, somewhere that they could set a future story. So everyone, just sitting quietly in the audience, could you just think for yourself of a special place in your life that would be a great setting for a narrative. It could be where you go on holidays, somewhere where you feel best or somewhere where you have fun or somewhere that's even a secret place for you. So think all about that place just quietly to yourself for 20 seconds. Great work, everyone. What I'd like you to do now is to share the place for your story with the person next to you. But of course, if it was a secret place that you were thinking about, you don't need to share that place. You could share another place instead. This time, we'll give you one minute just to share that place with the person sitting next to you. Teachers, feel free to share some of these places in the chat with us if you like. Well done, everyone. And teachers, you now have a great list of story settings to share in your classroom. Nadia, we've learned so much about storytelling through your book. And now we're curious to know how that was translated to the screen when My Place was adapted into a television series. So here's a great image of you with the cast from the series. I love this photo. Uh, what was it like for you to see the book go from page to screen? I met all the actors, especially in the first series, all these children. But on this particular day at the end of the film shoot, they brought them all together and grouped them at the big tree and me there with my hair rather a different colour in those days. And it was just like the time when I used to go to that tree and sit there by myself and imagine generations of children playing. And I saw the story brought to life. Now, what's one of the wonderful things about filmmaking or making a television series. It's such a collaborative way of working. Collaborative means when people work together. With a picture book such as My Place, I worked very closely with Donna, the illustrator. But with the TV series, I worked with different script writers, with the producer, with the director, and of course with all the actors, but also with all those people who develop the set and do the makeup and help the cars arrive and the buses arrive. I would imagine there was probably 200 or so people there every single day. So it was great to work with such a bunch of people making the television series and now to work with the ACTF and ACME on getting that story out to you people. Oh, thank you so much, Nadia. That's great to learn more about the behind the scenes and also to hear about our role in, in the My Place story. Uh, so I wanted to chat to you now about Laura. We've heard a little bit about Laura throughout this session. Laura is the first character in both the book and the TV series. Can you tell us how the storytelling changed for Laura between the book and the TV series? Yes, well, the very first night that I thought of the story, someone called Laura jumped into my head and she said, my name's Laura, this is my place. So Laura always had to be the host storyteller. And as you know, she's an Aboriginal girl, but her family have moved recently from the, city, from the country to the city. 
So that's one of the parts of Laura's story that we learn, but we don't learn very much of her story in the book because in the book we have the place of the story and we have the person of the storyteller. We know about their party and their pet and their map, but we don't know much else that happens. And in the TV series, the script writers had the freedom to develop the stories of the book. So there's much more of a story for Laura to be doing. She has friends, she has all sorts of interactions in the TV series. So they work together, but they're a little bit different. Just before we start the Q&A session, so I hope lots of you have been thinking about questions you might like to ask Nadia. Um, we have a clip to watch from season one, episode one, Laura's episode. In this clip, we are introducing, we are introduced, sorry, to Laura and the setting of my place. Let's watch and see this character come to life on screen. My name is Laura, and this is my place. Ha, huh, here comes Soraya, sneaking like a herd of elephants. Okay, I'll play her game. Hey, get away from my tree! I'm coming up. No, you're not! You can't stop me. Hey, that's mine! Well, now it's mine, and you're not getting it back. You give that back! <laughs> Soraya, she screams like she means it. Stop it! Another thing about Soraya, she's easy to catch, runs like a tortoise. Let go! Lay off of mine! No way! <laughs> what are you doing? We have to take the skull of Doom down the Magic River to the Sacred Island! The skull of Doom! Ended on a cliffhanger there, didn't we, Alan? Don't worry. <laughs> so you got to see just in that short clip all of the elements of story that Nadia has been speaking about today: place, people, and plot. That clip had such a great beginning that I'm sure you'll all want to watch the rest of the episode to find out what happens next. Thank you so much for sharing with us today about storytelling, Nadia. And now we're going to invite students to ask you their questions. I'm sure there are plenty of questions ready to go in the chat. Uh, let's start with this one that's come through. Ellen? Uh, are any of your characters based on real people? Okay, well, with any writer, the first real person that you draw upon is yourself. So in a way, Laura and Baron Guru and everyone, even the boys, um, come out of me and so are a part of me. Um, but they're also what we might call composite characters, characters composed of all sorts of little bits. And so I put different bits of people that I know and meet 
together into the one character. But this book also had a lot of research in it, both for me and for Donna, the illustrator. So we spent a lot of time in libraries finding out about the real people who came from all across the world to live in the area that we call my place. And we also did a lot of research into the First Nations Aboriginal people who lived in this area. So it's a combination of looking at the history of real people and knowing real people and putting them into the story. Thanks so much, Nadia. That's really interesting to hear about your process. Um, still on the topic of character, someone is wondering about uh, the characters that are in the TV series. So we know that additional characters were created for the My Place TV series. Which of those new characters was your favourite and why? Well, I, re I really like Muhammad, the boy who's in episode two, and I really like his story. I love him because he's such an interesting boy, but also such a gentle boy and such a courageous boy because he goes and plays cricket with the girls' cricket team. So I think he has to be my favourite. But I also like the girls that are in the second episode, the girls from the Vietnamese family, and I love the scene when they're having that competitive race to, ra to roll up... Um, rice paper rolls because I find it very hard to roll up rice paper rolls they always come out messy so I love that screen when the two girls are doing that as a competition all right I have a question for Bur from Barunga primary school does Nadia have a favorite story in the book yeah, well, my favourite story would have to be Baron Guru, wouldn't it? And that's very special because she gets that extra page. So my favourite page in the book is that page we saw with Baron Guru sitting up in the big tree with the sunset around her showing the colours of the Aboriginal flag and her talking about her grandmother and what her grandmother says, which, of course, is those magic words forever and ever. So that's my favourite bit in the book. Um, Nadia, I've got a question here from a grade four class at Hillsmead. They're wondering how many books you have written and even if you have some non-published books. Yes, well, I never can quite remember and that's not because I've um, written so many but because I'm actually very bad at arithmetic. I've probably published about five books for adults and probably about 15 to 20 books for children ranging from little children or picture books um, through to books for quite old teenagers. But yes, I've got a whole garage full of unpublished books. So a lot of my writing fails and that's probably what happens to everybody's writing that you start with great enthusiasm but somehow it's not the right story for the right time. So I never just throw it away immediately. I try and I try. I go and do more maps because that's my drafting process. But eventually I sometimes just put a story away in the garage and I think I'll come back to that another day. So I know that you don't have time to do that always, that you've got to get your homework in on Monday morning or you've got only a class to do a story in. And I think an idea for children writing stories is not to try to do something too big. Sometimes I see wonderfully imaginative things but with lots and lots of characters and lots of locations and plots and I think this could be 26 episodes of a TV series. So you've got to learn to try to get your stories down small enough so that you can do it in a class session or over the weekend. Okay, I've got another question. It's from, sorry if I get uh, the school names wrong, sorry, uh, but Bangor, Bangor? Bangor Primary School, hopefully uh, you know who you are. Uh, why did you choose to be an author? When I was very young, my mother used to read me lots of books, but she also used to tell me lots of stories, stories about her time growing up as a little girl in the country and in the city. And I just love stories so much that I remember I was only about five years old when I said to her, I want to write books when I grow up. And she said to me, well, if you want to do that, you'll surely do it. And I did. Well, that's great to have that encouragement, Nadia, and that you were able to follow that path. Uh, so we have a question here from Doncaster Gardens who are wanting to know what challenges you have faced when writing your own books. 
Oh, look, I get up every morning at half past five and I face a challenge every single morning. Um, but I also love writing more than anything else, so I wouldn't swap it for another job. Um, at times, um, the characters just don't seem to know um, how to do what I want them to do. And at times, I also get a little bit lost in the place and so what I always do is go back to the place of the story and I walk it again and I do another map. So how long has the big tree been there? Did you have a big tree when you were a little girl? There were lots of trees that I loved when I was a little girl and even though I wasn't very good at sport I did love climbing trees and I used to climb up a tree sometimes often with a book and would read a book up in a, a tree. The actual big tree that you see in the photo behind Ellen and Janine and that you saw in my photos and it was a location in the TV series, someone told me the other day that it had been there for about 400 years and I believe that and so that takes us back into the time before my ancestors came here from England and other places, the time that we've called deep time today, the time when First Nations people only were living in this land and caring for this land. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, now we have a question here from Williamstown North. This is an interesting one. Is there anything you regret including or not including in your stories? Ah, actually I found something today when I was reading the book um, and on the very last page the words big tree should have capital letters so that was oh. something that's missed my eye um, for a very long time. It's a great question because a lot of writing and it goes back to that question about challenges, more writing is about chopping out than putting in. So it's really, really easy to think of lots of people and lots of stories and lots of history that you want to put in. But there's lots and lots that you have to push out. So we could have told lots more stories in the book and people um, very helpfully often told me this and yes, I could have done this, but I was trying to bring it down to something that would be a size that you could read. And sometimes it seemed right to stay with the same family. We stay with the German family for a while and we stay with the Greek family for a while. Um, we stay with a couple of other families and sometimes we only meet a family for one 10-page spread. But in addition to the stories that are told in the book, there's all those little stories if you go along the map and look at the street and you see different shopkeepers and different things, there's other little stories tucked into the maps and so yes I regret that I couldn't put them all in there but even when we had the much bigger format of the TV series there's still lots and lots of wonderful stories that we didn't get room to put in and again the TV makers would tell you that snip 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 probably they do it in a different way but they used to do it with a pair of scissors snip 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 Lots of things get left on what used to be called the cutting room floor, and that's the bits of the story that get cut out. Great. We have a question here from Fairfield Primary School. Did you have anything to do with the casting of the characters in the TV series or any other elements on the TV production? In the TV series, if you look at the credits, um, you'll see that I'm called Story Consultant and History Consultant. So I did have a role um, when the scriptwriters were working to read their words on paper or on computer screen and to tell them if they were getting the history wrong or to make suggestions. They're not the right to boss them around and tell them what to do. But once the filming started, I didn't, I could come along as a guest, but I didn't have a right to tell people what to do because you can't have too many people telling someone to, what to do. And in a TV show or a film, there's the person called the director who directs things. And it was the director, particularly the director for the first few episodes, a woman called Jessica Hobbs, who decided on who were going to be the actors. And as I understand it, she ran workshops for a lot of young actors and she tried them out for it. And when she talked to me about that process, she said she was interested in who was listening. She wanted to see who could listen. And her words were to do with, she wanted to know that when she said something, 
they listened to what she was actually saying and not what they thought she was saying or not what they would like her to be saying, but to what she was saying. And that's a really good lesson for all of us in life, I think, to concentrate on listening. I think that is a good lesson for all of us, Nadia. Um, Definitely, whether you're whatever job you're doing in your life. Um, Now, I can't believe it, but we've only got a couple of minutes left of this event today. Um, We've had so many questions that we won't have a chance to get to, but there were some great questions about books that I think would be lovely to finish on. So some student questions about books for Book Week, Nadia. Uh, What was your favourite book when you were young? And who is your favourite author? Okay, I'm going to answer the first one, but not the second one. So I had many, many favourite books when I was young. But when I was young, we didn't have nearly as many books available as you do today. And it was very particularly hard to find books by Australian authors because all our books were made in England. And there weren't very many stories with girls in them. One of my favourite books that was about a girl was a book that some of you will know and it was called Pippi Longstocking. So it was written by a Swedish author but it was about a girl who lives alone in a cottage with a horse and a monkey and who gets up to hilarious adventures. And I think I loved it because she was such a strong and funny character. I'm not going to tell you who my favourite author is because my favourite author changes probably every day of the week. And so it's up to you to find your own favourite authors. Okay, thank you, Nadia, um, for such an interesting and inspiring conversation today. I know that the students and teachers will leave today with some great storytelling tips to improve their planning and writing. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thanks again from me as well, Nadia. I think my favourite tip for students, um, which you mentioned, Nadia, was to put some work aside. If it's not perfect at the beginning, you can put that story aside and come back to it at a later time and perhaps that will be the right moment for you. Yes, and another tip I always give when people ask for tips is remember that reading and writing are the same process. So I often meet people who want to be writers and I say, so what do you read? And oh, I don't really read very much. I mainly just watch play games and watch TV. If you don't read, you can't write. Reading and writing are like breathing in and breathing out and you can't do one without the other. So as we celebrate Children's Book Week, let's all go and find a book and read it. I love that advice. Yes, so good for everybody to get out there and read, read, read. So thank Mm. you again, Nadia. And teachers, we would love to know what you and your students enjoyed about today's session with Nadia. Uh, We're sharing a link in the chat for our feedback form. Uh, This feedback helps us to continue funding these free sessions for your classrooms. So your support in filling them out is really important to us. Now, for any classes who would love to apply these new storytelling ideas from Nadia, we would love to have you enter the 2023 My Place competition. So you can find the details for this writing competition on the ACTF website. And if you'd like to catch up on all these My Place TV episodes that we've spoken about today, you can find series one and two on ABC iView. Thanks again to everyone for joining us today and enjoy the rest of book week. Bye. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Happy book week. (laughs) 